Now for Golf Today Roundtable as we welcome in our favourite Muppets, Waldorf and Statler of Golf Channel, Rex Hoggard and Ryan Lavner, who are out on site all week. Rex, I want to start with you. Are we at dominant number one status now? We've had this debate this morning, George and I, that there's still a ways to go, but in terms of the competition that he's got right now, forget measuring him against Tiger, is Scotty Schefter truly a dominant number one? I think if you look at the math, the world ranking math, he's leading now by four and a half average world ranking points. And you're right, that doesn't compare to Tiger Woods in his prime, doesn't even come close to that. But I think it compares well to what DJ did when he was playing his best golf, or Rory McIlroy did when he was playing his best golf. And I think George touched on it in the last segment. Relative to the rest of the field, yes, he is dominant. And I know you look at last season and how he finished up essentially after the spring when he made all his hay. It's not as though he was missing cuts. It's not as though he was finishing tied for 55th. It was top 10 every week, week in and week out. Now we end up here where he has done it in back-to-back -back weeks, where he's found a way to putt, not great, but average. And if he just puts average, he is going to be a dominant player. So what we've seen this fortnight absolutely adds up to a dominant player. And Rex, um, I mean, touching on what you just shared as far as where that gap is right now between Scotty Scheffler at world number one and Roy McIlroy at world number two. Largest gap since Dustin Johnson, and that was seven years ago. Scotty in week 43 of being world number one. DJ had a 64-week run. And then the next largest gap was Roy McIlroy in 2015. He went for 54 weeks. Um, Lab, I, you see a lot of these guys who have three, four-year run of greatness, and, and then they fall back a gear. With Scotty Scheffler, we, we see what he just did. He's world number one right now. We want to say he can do this for the next decade. How much staying power do you think he's going to have? I think it's a lot, and I heard you guys in the opening segment, and I think a lot obviously depends on whether he can stay healthy. Scotty Scheffler has made a concerted effort over the past couple of years, not to necessarily get bigger in the gym or stronger in the gym, but really to, to maintain his flexibility. He was really plagued by, by some back issues in college that kind of uh, derailed some of the momentum he had as a junior player. I mean, he's one of the best junior players in, in, in U.S. history. Uh, and so that has always kind of been front of mind with Scotty Scheffler, maintaining flexibility, making sure he's doing the right things, because the, the consistency that he has on a week-in, week, week week-out basis it does take a, a toll on his body, and I think he's done a really good job about that. I think the thing about Sky Scheffler right now that, that Rex just touched on is that there's kind of like an inevitability to Scotty Scheffler. There's almost an infallibility when it comes to Sky Scheffler as well. All you needed to do was listen to his peers on Sunday, whether it was Xander Schauffele or Wyndham Clark saying, you know, quote, of course Sky Scheffler was going to be in the mix because that's what he does as the best player in the world that's now 27 consecutive uh, under par rounds and I, I so I think you know regardless of what the rankings say currently regardless of how big the gap is between Scotty uh, as world number one and Roy McIlroy as world number two I think all of his peers now know that in order to win the golf tournament they're going to have to beat Scotty Scheffler and that appears to be an increasingly difficult task and the size of that gap is is obviously growing the, the gap between Scotty Scheffler and Rory is the same gap as Rory to number 19 in the rankings. And Sam Burns, Ryan, you were out there with that final group yesterday. What does Xander Shoffley take away from this? We haven't really talked about him much today. It's another near miss, which you might think would be a negative for him, but he's also pretty early in this working relationship with Chris Como. And if you're getting this close to a big championship, that's got to be considered a positive. What do you think his reaction or mindset is today? Yeah, I think the early returns certainly have to be positive in his work uh, right now with, with Chris Como. I mean, this was still Xander Shoffley's tournament to win with eight holes to go. Obviously did not birdie 11. Uh, missed his mark by just a couple of feet on 14. Made bogey there on 15. That was a ball that he probably gets up and down, uh, he said, more than half of the time. And then on, on 17, I'm sure he would like that read or at least that stroke back uh, from six feet on 17, which cost him uh, a much needed birdie there. But, you know, Xander, uh, I think, has, has now has five top tens. Uh, it's the second most on tour this season. And the progress that they're making, he, is, he has full trust in Chris Como. Essentially, they're, they're trying to get him to a place where he's a, a, from an above average driver of the golf ball to an elite driver of the golf ball. That's kind of the target range where he's trying to get into the low to mid 180s uh, average ball speed, where if he couples that with the trajectory that he hits, he, he's going to experience a distinct advantage just by able to, to fly bunkers, 
or cut corners. He has full trust in what Chris Cuomo's doing, and I don't think there's anything over these past couple months that should dissuade him from thinking that eventually uh, he's going to knock down that door more consistently and not be the player who I think golf fans are a little bit frustrated with, where he's so talented, he has no weaknesses in his game, and yet he still can't quite snag that significant title. Rex, with Wyndham Clark, uh, how should we label him after the run the last couple of weeks finishing back-to-back? -back? Is he a big game hunter officially, or are we going to go with a different moniker? I would aim, uh, label him angry after last night. He was certainly the guy who left property probably with uh, the, the biggest chip on his shoulder based on just what he said afterwards. And, yes, I think big game hunter is also a fair comparison on this. I mean, you don't finish back-to-back -back at Bay Hill and then TPC Sawgrass to Scotty Shuffler. And not have what it takes to win on the PGA Tour. The putt on 18, it was heartbreaking. It was the height of theater. And I think he's probably going to need a day or two to sort of unwind and take a deep breath and then realize that everything he's doing is right. That, as Eamon pointed out, you don't have to make big mistakes at TPC Sawgrass. You don't have to make big mistakes when you're going head-to-head -to -head with the world number one to lose a golf tournament. He wasn't going to give it away. So I think what he's seen so far this season, winning at Pebble Beach, uh, finishing with a final round 60 there, coming up just short last week at Bay Hill, coming up just short at TPC Sawgrass. Yeah, he's mad, but I think as he gets further and further down the road from this, he's only going to take positives. Rex, we've seen a lot of the same things from Rory McIlroy this year in the sense that every time he talks after a round to the media, there are comments that make news, and what we're seeing inside the ropes is far short of his best. This T19 finish at uh, Sawgrass, his first top 20 on the PGA Tour this year, does he need to be a little bit more like Scotty Scheffler and kind of tune out the noise and focus on his business? I think he probably would like to be, but I don't think it's in his nature. I go back to a couple of years ago when Jordan Spieth had just come out on tour and we kind of all gravitate, gravitated to him for a lot of different reasons, to the way he played the game, the way he was winning, and really the way he engaged with the media. He didn't hold anything back. There was really no secrets. He was an open book. And I remember him saying at one point, I feel like I need to start saying less. And as we've seen years now have gone by since he made that comment, he didn't because it's not in his nature. And I think when Rory, it's not in his nature not to answer questions honestly like he did on Sunday at TPC Sawgrass and quite frankly I think he wanted to send a message when he was asked specifically about the meeting between the player directors and uh, representatives from Saudi Arabia's public investment fund today I think having met with Yasser al rumayan the governor of the public investment fund himself he knows what the message is going to be and I think he views this as a very positive step of course the less Rory says the less we actually have to talk about here guys and <laughs>